All right, so we'll go ahead and get started now. Um, thank everybody for coming out. We've got a nice little group here. Um, talk today about practical tools for uh, for sample design uh, for uh, monitoring and assessment. Uh, this is the uh, what well, I guess this is the seventh of these uh, web seminars that we've done this year, and uh, um, it's the last. Uh, one of the series that we'll do, and uh, um, probably more of, of these next year. Um, given the size of the group and the number of people that we have, I'd kind of like this to, to um, more of a discussion today rather than a, than a lecture on my part. So if you have questions, um, you know, why don't you just go ahead and ask them, uh, um, you know, during the, uh, the, the course of the presentation, and uh, we'll see. If we can't, uh, um, you know, thing together. I also noticed that there are several uh, on the the seminar day who have a fair amount of experience with statistics, um, and I'd, I'd like to ask that uh, um, if, if through the course of the um, of the presentation, if there's something that, that needs to be clarified or or uh, could be restated a little bit better or corrected. Uh, let's go ahead and, and, and pipe up and chime in. Um, statistics, I think, is one of those fields that it's it's best if you have multiple people uh, offering explanations uh, um, of the concepts. So let's can can everybody see the screen? That's always the first thing we have to establish with these WebEx things. Yep. Okay. Go ahead and uh, we'll. we'll Start from the beginning here. Um, what I wanted to do first uh, is just to talk a little bit about um, assessment and monitoring inventory in in terms of the context uh, that it you know, that it within in in the adaptive management uh, sort of framework. Uh, we talk about a lot of times assessment, inventory, and monitoring as if they're their own sort of standalone. Uh, things, but they they're designed, they're intended to always happen within a management uh, management context. At the highest level, you know, we start by setting some sort of goals or, or objectives, management goals or objectives. And if you follow sort of the the uh, um, the guidance and the, and the the guidance that's out there, then the next thing that we should be thinking about is um, what's a suitable model that describes uh, the system that we're dealing with and how it functions. Um, model is a great ex exercise and, and a great tool for helping us figure out what we know and what we don't know. And a lot of times the, the, the model or the process of deriving the model can identify research needs that we might need to fill. And I want to I wanna back to the research aspect of it here um, in a little bit and, and sort of contrast the thing that we we would do in research for or against the sampling that we do for assessment and monitoring. So a model that we're comfortable with that really describes our system, then we go through a process of selecting indicators. So, okay, what are the aspects of the model that are uh, um, that are to see change given our management and monitoring objectives? And then pick a suite of indicators that, that give us a window on, on measuring that change. Uh, there then we can start into the actual uh, inventory and assessment process, which gives us some baseline data to help us figure out what's the state of our system um, right now. We uh, uh, you know, enter these data that we have um, based on the indicators and our, our ecological model. We do something on the ground and then we monitor uh, the, the, the results of that. Um, and it's designed to be sort of this this cyclical or actually spiral process where if, if we if we don't get the results that we that we want out of our management action, we try something different. Um, and so it's to to you know give a stream of data um, that, that we're always able to uh, uh, to interpret. Now, in terms of actually implementing monitoring and assessment, there are a lot of steps to, to, to go through to actually do it, you know, to, to put their 
a, a robust and a plan that's going to meet the needs that, that you have. And the first thing that we need to do is state what our management objective is, and then from that, drive some sort of assessment or monitoring objective. Now, you can see I've used these sort of bi-directional arrows here. With all of the steps, um, it's an iterative process. You'll go back and forth a number of times between the steps, and they might necessarily happen in the order that, that I've got them listed here, but it's a fairly uh, a good list of, of things to, to actually do. Once our objectives then, as we saw in the previous slide, then we, we develop uh, an ecological model for our system that we can use to help us uh, design our assessment and monitoring uh, program. And I'll just sort of do a side note here. Um, the ecological site descriptions can be uh, really useful not only in terms of, of the models, because most of the ecological site descriptions have models within them, uh, but also in, in, in terms of um, uh, being a tool that we can use in later stages of, of designing our assessment and monitoring program. We go in and we select, based on our model, we select indicators and then, uh, or indicators of the, the ecosystem, um, and then we select methods so um, to measure these indicators. And here we need to make a choice whether we're going to use qualitative uh, indicators and methods or whether we're going to pick uh, more quantitative methods. And it's going to derive some of the uh, other choices that we make later on in terms of analyses that we do and, uh, and how we draw conclusions from the data that we have. We, uh, a previous web seminar, uh, we talked about the Rangeland Methods Guide. Um, that's the URL for it there. And that's a, a helpful tool for figuring, okay, what are uh, some methods that we can use to, uh, to measure different indicators how do they relate to each other, when we might we use one uh, over another, and that kind of thing. Okay, the next thing we need to do once we have uh, indicators selected and to go of those indicators is we need to figure out how much of a change are we looking for. And this monitoring context uh, more than an assessment or inventory context. But monitoring, how much of a change is significant to us from a management perspective. Um, you know, we could go out and sample to, to measure a 5% difference in, in whatever it is. It's probably going to take a lot of effort to do that. And from a management standpoint, is 5% change uh, you know, really that big? Um, in a lot of cases, we're looking at detecting changes, right, like 50% change, or, or we know if the amount of cheap grass um, you know, it's decreased by 50% or has it uh, increased by 50%. So we're really, in a lot of instances, looking at big amounts of change for monitoring, but we need to front and specify and quantify how much change that we're, we want to see, be able to detect. Okay, next thing uh, we need to do is define our inference space. And uh, I'm just going to leave it at that right now, and we're going to talk about inference space uh, in more detail in, in in a couple of slides here. And then find our sampling unit. What's the smallest area on the ground that we're actually sampling? Um, and the, the collection of these sampling units helps us define um, our inference space. I'll figure out once we have these data, how are we actually going to analyze them? Uh, in some cases, the technique that you choose for analyzing the data will dictate uh, some of your aspects of your sample design or how you go out and collect those data. That's always a good thing to, to determine before you actually get out in the field. And then we estimate the number of samples that we need uh, in order to um, detect the change that we, um, that we need to detect. This is where a study uh, is really useful. Uh, and a pilot study can be used not only to figure out how many samples we need, but also to test out a whole bunch of different aspects of your, your monitoring and assessment plan, like, um, you know, the methods that you're using or the uh, 
analysis techniques that you uh, that you, that you plan to employ. If pilot study is not feasible or there are time constraints, uh, sometimes you can use existing data from uh, a similar site and uh, use that to derive uh, an estimate of how many samples that you'll need to detect uh, to detect change. And the last step I have here in this list, again, these aren't necessarily in any particular order, but is to select the sampling locations. So we've figured out what we're going to sample, that's the indicators, and how to sample them, that's the methods. Now we have to figure out where we're going to sample these things at. And then, once we have all that, um, and we're comfortable with our plan, then we can actually go out and collect the data that we need and analyze it. So today, um, just to sort of an outline, we're going to focus on the aspects of sort of this long chain uh, of events here. Um, the first is this sort of using these ecological models to help us define or help us develop our sampling program. And uh, the second one is to uh, estimate the number of samples uh, that we'll need and to do uh, power analyses on the data that we have. And then the third is to select uh, sampling locations, so the actual sample design aspect of it. Um, we're over just some concepts, and uh, I'll try to be brief uh, on the concepts, but I thought we need to make sure that we, we have some, some ground rules and that we're all on the same page uh, in, in, in terms of the, the jargon that we're going to uh, use here uh, for sling. And, um, we'll go through and uh, use some tools that are available uh, for, for you to use uh, in, in designing and implementing monitoring and assessment uh, programs. And then, um, we're actually going to try to go through and demonstrate these things um, sort of live. And it's always a, a risky thing to do in these web seminars, but we're going we're gonna to give it a shot. Um, throughout the presentation today, um, I've tried to make notes for you know, sort of sources or references where information comes from. Um, rather than try to cram all that into the presentation, I put it all in a separate uh, Word document along with the links for all of the tools that we'll be talking about and uh, uh, some links to some other information. So I'll the URL up for all that at the, at the end. Um, where you can go and find that. If you, anybody has difficulty, uh, just just let me know, and uh, and I can just send those things to you directly. So right in, uh, we talked about, or I brought up this sort of notion of inference space um, in the in the last couple of slides, and it's sort of a central concept to uh, to, to sample for assessment and monitoring. Your inference space is really entire universe or that entire, I don't want to say area because it's defined by more than area, but it's that it's the sum total of everything that you want to apply your results to. And defined by a lot of different factors. And the first, and first is this thing called a sampling frame. Basically, that's the boundary of your study area. Uh, so in this, in this map here, um, this is an area in southern Idaho. And this is just sort of an arbitrary sampling frame, but the, the black line in the map defines the extent of our sampling, the aerial extent of the sampling. And, and so it would be part of the sampling frame. The other aspect of the sampling frame that's really important is what is the actual sampling unit. And so sampling frame has to be completely tessellated by these sampling units are completely sort of beat up into these sampling units. For the map here, these, uh, the, the, they're a little difficult, but these little polygons uh, within the, the black polygon, those are, are the individual sample units. And so the combination of the sample units and the sample frame are sort of the start of defining our inference space. But there are other things that sort of uh, define it too, or limit the the uh, ability to, to uh, draw conclusions about this area. And one of them is the time period, or the time sort of uh, the extent of time over which we're sampling. Um, 
The other one might be, uh, you know, the objective that we have. If uh, if we're interested in looking at sage grouse habitat in this area, then um, the sort of factors relevant to sage grouse in, in here are going to help us define uh, our inference space. So sampling that we go out and and do for sage grouse um, may or may not be appropriate appropriate to looking at other things like, say, juniper expansion uh, in this area. So the, the inference space, uh, what I want to sort of take home from this is that the inference space is more than just the study area boundary and the individual sampling units within that boundary. It's defined by um, a number of other different things that, that, that sort of give the limits for drawing conclusions from, from the data. Now, a couple of other important things with reference space is that from a statistical sampling point of view, every sample unit in the reference space has to have some probability of being selected for sampling. If zero probability that it's selected for sampling, then it's not part of the inference space. Okay, and this is really important um, and comes up a lot uh, in assessment and monitoring plans that, that I've reviewed or helped people develop because um, a lot of times they inadvertently restrict their inference space when they don't mean to. And so an example of this would be, say, for um, monitoring uh, livestock grazing within an allotment. Um, you know, too close to water features and you're going to have really high impact uh, areas that probably aren't really representative of, of the, uh, or we could say they might not be representative of the allotment as a whole, and so it'd be tempting to sort of exclude those areas from the sampling. Um, but doing that, your inference space is no longer the allotment. It's the allotment that's not within some dense of a water feature. And so it'd be okay for, for, for um, you know, a particular application, but, but it might. And so some careful thought and consideration needs to be given to what the inference space is and then to make sure that you you preserve that inference space. Okay, this concept is randomization. And we said that in, uh, every uh, sample unit within the inference space has to have some chance of being selected for sampling. And so, uh, so sampling then, each of these randomly selected locations represents some known amount of area within the inference space. Um, the problem is that um, a lot of times we're tempted to do or we do do non-random uh, sample site selection. And the issue with that is that we may think that, or we may even know that that area is representative of a larger area, but we can't quantify how much of a larger area that site is representative of, um, because it's technically not part of a of an inference space. Um, and other issues that we have with, with these uh, um, non-random uh, locations is that they may be representative for one objective, but but not for another. Um, or they may be uh, sensitive to change not related to the original objective. And that's sort of what these this sort of figure on the left is trying to illustrate here. So uh, um, we would have, say, a um, key area that would be like this plus sign here that was uh, located to be in a certain sort of uh, buffer zone around a water feature in an allotment. Um, and, you know, we can say for uh, for the sake of argument that this key is in fact representative of the sort of great pressure within this allotment. And we have uh, in this uh, new oh, we have a new uh, energy development feature that comes in, and it's a zone of influence around it, and it has other sort of uh, um, effects on the the study area, like a new road or an improved road in the area, and those have sort of zones of influence around those, and the effect of those um, might cause change 
to this key area and sort of make it sort of longer representative of, of the impact that that uh, raising is having in the allotment. Not to say that you know random points aren't also uh, affected by this, but have a greater ability to, to um, conclusions to the larger extent using the random locations than we do the uh, the, the non-random ones. I want to draw just attention real quick to the there's a Link at the excuse me. There's a link at the bottom here. Um, on the, the methods guide, the rangelandmethods.org uh, website, there are um, uh, session uh, topics or basically like short essays or short sort of discussions of different concepts. And so, when, when they're appropriate, I've tried to include those uh, um, at the bottom. And the links for all of those are in this uh, the references document that we can get on this page. So, uh, random information is important for for survey sampling. Uh, every area within an inference has to have some ability of being selected for sampling. But there's something that says that those probabilities have to be the same. They can they are the same. We call that equal probability sampling. But in order to vary based on uh, some sort of related variable like say distance to water which is is uh you know an important factor for uh for livestock grazing or uh, a vegetation index like, like an ndvi found those some probabilities chance that we will select uh, a site for sampling if we allow that to vary we gain some efficiencies in our sampling um, and one of those is that it allows to focus our effort on areas that are more likely to be experiencing change, and that gives us a greater sensitivity or greater ability to, to detect that change with a, with, a, with a given amount of sampling. You can tweak this so that you can, say, uh, preferentially select areas that are, you know, say, closer to roads or easier to get to. Um, and there's nothing technical with that. Um, you don't realize the same efficiency gains in sampling by using those kinds of variables as you do in using variables that are related to the indicators that you're measuring. Now, technically, what we're doing when we use uh, unequal probability sampling is drawing a biased sample of um, locations within our inference space. But we know what the bias is associated with those samples. And so we can correct for it in our analysis or in the estimator that we use. And the last thing here is really important, um, that if we're going to use unequal probability selection, we have to use an analysis technique or an estimator that accounts for the selection probabilities. If we don't, then basically we're just calculating a biased sample of, of our inference space. Here's just a, an example at the bottom equal probability selection, so these these points were generated without any rents to the, the sort of color gradient um, below them. On the right-hand side, then I use the color gradient as uh, a probability layer to um, to weight the samples towards the, the darker areas and away from the lighter areas. Uh, you know, this is, you know, we've bought this sample, but we know what the bias is, so in the estimator, I can correct for, for that and get a similar estimate uh, for the equal probability as I do for the unequal probability selection. Okay, uh, let me pause here. Are, did, are there questions? Am I, am I people already here, or are we, are we pretty good? I'll silence as agreement, and we'll uh, we'll keep forging on here. Okay, we're almost done here. The the next concept I want to touch on briefly is stratification, and by I mean putting our study area up into subunits and sampling within those subunits. The reason we would do that is to try to minimize uh, variability within our strata and to make our sort of group our samples to be sort of more homogeneous or more closer uh, to each other in value. And 
we can sample, we can vary the intensity of the sampling within the data based on how variable the conditions are. So if this sort of gray stratum here uh, has a lot of variability in there, maybe I'll devote more sampling effort to that. Or the other thing that we can do is say, okay, well, this gray area is sensitive to the, the management action or the disturbance that I'm interested in. So maybe I want to you know, put a little more effort there so I can detect smaller amounts of change and be able to do something about that quicker. So gratification can increase the efficiency of our sampling by sort of splitting out that variability um, and putting them very between the strata and not within the strata, and also increase the sensitivity uh, of our strata, or of our sampling. Important though is that, that if we're going to do stratification, we should pick state units. We don't want units that are going to be changing over time. And the units that we use for stratification should be related to the indicators that we're actually measuring uh, in the field. So it's just a sort of a, a, a pictorial example of this. Um, one way we might stratify a landscape based on sort of you know based on land forms, right? Think about like grazing. We might want to put most of our effort in this riparian area because that's probably going to see a, a, a lot of uh, uh, use and um, uh, impact grazing. We might put a bit less effort on sort of this flat um, you know, area next to riparian area, and probably the least amount of effort uh, up here on the on the hill slope. So just a, again an example of how we might accomplish stratification in a landscape. Um, one last slide, and then we're we're on to the fun stuff here. Um, I wanted to contrast a little bit, um, sort of, the reasons why we might do sampling on a landscape. And the reason I want to do this again is because I've seen in, in the, the the people that we interacted with that, that um, there's really good understanding a lot of times of, of the different reasons for sampling and the implication that that has on, on um, on how you do your sampling. So on the left here we've got sampling for monitoring and assessment, and on the right we've got sort of sampling for uh, research or, or modeling purposes. Uh, and so with these, we have differences in uh, a number of things, like our objective. With monitoring and assessment, we're trying to establish the condition of uh, trend of a landscape over time. Uh, research, we might be looking at uh, trying to explain patterns or attribute cause uh, to something, or maybe make predictions um, within a you know, within a landscape. The inference space is different for monitoring and assessment, or can be different for monitoring and assessment versus research uh, or modeling. Optimization also in monitoring and assessment, we need to make sure we randomize our selection in order to be draw conclusions to the area we, that we want. Um, now, I put the metrics there because there are some exceptions to that, but they request us to make uh, a lot of assumptions in terms of how the ecosystem functions and actually develop a, a quantitative model for uh, um, you know, linking our uh, the data or our observations to the, uh, to the results that we get. Um, within research or modeling context, you know, we might use randomization to uh, assign experimental treatments to different spots on the on on the ground. Um, we may use randomization in other contexts. Uh, times for modeling exercises, randomization might not even be necessary. Um, this is a big difference between them. Um, the difference that to really call attention to is how we interpret the error or the uncertainty with our results. Uh, for monitoring an assessment that, that, that we're interested in is, you know, likely is it that the results that we got actually encompass the, the, value, the actual value that was on the ground? Is the, the significant difference that I detected uh, or the difference that I detected, is it significant from a management standpoint? For modeling context, a lot of times we're interested in 
the you know are these explanatory variables that we that we um, that we found or these uh, the treatments that we applied you know they actually lead to the results that we that we got so there's a difference there's several differences uh, in sampling for assessment versus research and modeling um, that that you know sort of dictate uh, you go about the sampling that you do. Okay, any questions to this point right, before we get into the to the nuts and bolts here? Okay. So um, I'm going to talk briefly about ecological site descriptions and how we can use those in a practical sense for assessment and monitoring. Uh, we'll, we'll look at calculating sample sizes using a, a web-based tool uh, that was here at the Hornada. And then we'll actually get into sample design tools. And there's a number of those to run through, just doing some basic stuff in Excel, demonstrating that. Um, and then the rest of them will be in ArcGIS with, with various tools. And um, I, you know, I realize uh, many of you might have, have seen these uh, these tools or use them already, um, and that's great. If you have any anything to offer, please do. Um, I think some of them will be uh, will be fairly new uh, to you as well. Okay, ecological site descriptions. Uh, ecological sites are sort of defined as, as uh, areas on the ground with with, with simple soils and climate and abiotic factors that support. Uh, similar kinds of vegetative communities. And so a system has the potential for land to uh, uh, to develop and support vegetation communities. Um, in the United States, at least, for most areas, these are fairly well-defined, and the communities that exist within an ecological site um, are described, and how these communities sort of move and transition back and forth to each other um, are also uh, defined as well as concepts like thresholds, which is sort of illustrated by this, the the red lines here in the in the diagram, can be known thresholds or suspected thresholds. Um, where if you cross that, it 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 takes a lot of effort or energy input into the system to cross back over to the other side. Um, with the ecological site descriptions, most uh, of them now have have uh, a, a transition model associated with them, and that's what sort of this is just a, a very generic example on the right hand side. And they show us how the, the, the plant communities within this ecological site respond to uh, different management or, or disturbance uh, um, events. Um, and so with the ecological sites now, um, I, for all the new ones that are being developed, and they're going back to most of the old ones now as well, there is a uh, what's called a reference sheet for them that that tells you what you can expect in terms of, of you know uh, cover and composition and uh, final attributes uh, of an ecological site, so that to help you interpret the data that that you have. So how would we use ecological site descriptions in a, in a sampling context from a real practical standpoint? Well, these ecological sites are tied to um, soil map units. And in the cases where the um, ecological sites don't correspond, you know, there might be more than one ecological site per soil map unit, um, in most cases we can actually map those ecological sites. And so that is an opportunity to define strata on the landscape um, as areas that will respond similarly to management or, or disturbance. And so it means of, of breaking up our landscape into uh, areas that we can sample. Um, logical site models also allow us to identify areas that, that are likely to experience change given uh, a management objective. Or, or, a, um, or a sort of disturbance uh, response that, that we would have. So an example of that would be, um, you know, in, in this map here is for an area in Craters of the Moon National Monument in southern Idaho. And um, uh, most of these ecological sites in this area contain a, a state 
for um, cheatgrass monoculture. And that's a, a state that, that has certainly crossed threshold in these systems, and it's very stable. And there's not a whole lot short of, of you know, intensive uh, restoration efforts that you can do to, to bring something back from, from cheatgrass monoculture. And so from a sampling standpoint, from an assessment or monitoring standpoint, uh, maybe we don't need to invest a lot of effort into sampling within cheatgrass monoculture areas. Or to generalize it a little bit more, maybe some of these ecological sites um, less sensitive to, uh, you know, to sort of changes from, from, from grazing, or they might be less uh, likely to experience grazing in the first place because you know, it might be uh, a low sagebrush community that's very, that has very low productivity. Um, so the ecological site models allow us to focus our, our, our efforts. And then they give us this aid to, to interpreting the results that we have. So results that we get, are they typical for an ecological site? Um, you know, uh, so there's three ways that we use ecological site descriptions for, for, for aid in, in, in sample design. Size and power calculation um, brings up the concept of statistical power. And power is the likelihood of detecting a difference between two samples if a one if, if a difference really exists, a, you know, a difference that's significant to us from a management standpoint. And paid to a number of things, um, including the, the sort of the variability in the data that you have. But important for this discussion is it's related to the, the number of samples that you have and how big of, of a difference it is that you want to detect. Uh, and I can't stress enough that it's really important to estimate how samples you're going to need before you go in the field um, because it, 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 it really is likely to get back and then realize that you don't have enough samples to actually detect um, uh, you know, a significant difference from a management standpoint. Um, and so the, the difference we want to be able to detect, we call that a minimum detectable difference. Uh, the other thing that, that's important to do, too, is when you come back and you do your analysis and you don't find a significant difference, you do a power calculation to make sure that you could detect a difference if there really was one there. Now you can do like Elzing et al. or um, the the Jeff Herrick uh, you know monitoring manual, and there are equations in the appendices that that walk you through how to calculate sample sizes. Well, we, I thought that was kind of archaic, so we developed this um, uh, tool called Mesret, the multi-scale sample requirements evaluation evaluation tool. Um, this is actually a, a web version of an Excel uh, spreadsheet tool that was did for the for the NRCS. So let, I'm going to switch over here to Mesret, and we'll actually walk through how it works. So um, when you come to Mesret, um, this is the page that you get a little bit of instructions uh, here into what you're doing. Uh, we'll just put a uh, name in here called uh, test demo and the property that we're measuring we'll we'll say it's uh shrub cover. Okay. Uh click the next button and this is bring us up a box where we can actually uh enter data. Uh we can appear and we could we could type actual data values in um for number of plots that we have. Um so say our pilot you know so he had five plots or six plots, and we were doing line intercept, um, you know, by the book, and so we did three transects per plot. So we would have sort of three rows and, and, and what, six, five columns here, okay? Uh, I'm going to actually just import some data, and uh, you can import it right from Excel spreadsheets. And, uh, these data, just, these are made data. Um, so in this case, we had four plots, and uh, we went hog wild, and we did nine per per plot. Um, so if we click the button here, we calculate the variances for that, 
It'll give us a mean and a variance uh, for each plot, and then it'll calculate some overall statistics that we need uh, for for the next stage in the in the analysis. So I'm going to click this button here, and then we're going to calculate our sample sizes based on the data from the previous page. Two different things going on here. In the top right corner, we have uh, if we were interested in in detecting differences between plots, um, how many samples would we need? And so uh, here we had, uh, what was our, our mean was like 0.3, uh, I'm going to flip for a second, hold on. Our mean was 0.342. If we wanted to detect a, uh, you know, so 34%. So if we wanted to detect a change of 10 percentage points, uh, so an increase to say 0.42, um, between plots, or a difference between plots of 0.42, we'd seven samples to do that. Okay. If you're interested in, say, more landscape scale perspective, or say, a you know, whole allotment perspective, then we're going to have a table at the bottom. And this is say, okay, well, for our uh, minimum detectable difference of 0.1 or 30% difference here, and I have, uh, you know, you know plots or samples per plot, then I'm going to need 17 plots. Okay. If I only do one sample per plot, I'm going to need 23 plots in order to do it. Okay. The results allow you to sort of you know, play these scenario games um, in terms of how you allocate your effort. Um, am I going to do more samples per plot and fewer plots, or am I going to do fewer samples at any given plot and do more plots on the ground? Okay. Um, we'll come here. Uh, we'll go to the next page. So going out and sampling on the ground, uh, you know, and you're designing an assessment or monitoring project, you need the first two tabs for this. Uh, the last tab is for when you've collected all your data and you come back into the office and you're analyzing your data. Um, you end here and you go to the third tab, and this tells this is sort of the power analysis. Um, if you had enough plots to actually detect the difference that you were interested in. And we're going to say, okay, well, I think I did what five plots, and I took nine uh, samples per plot, and I was interested in a uh, you know a difference of of uh, ten percentage points here. Go ahead, and calculate my power. Whoops, there we go. Okay, so for the differences between individual plots. I couldn't actually detect the difference that I was interested in. My minimum detectable difference wasn't. Oh no, I could detect it. Sorry. My yeah, my absolute minimum detectable difference was 0.09. I, I wanted to to detect 30% change, so the power here was actually I, I could detect a 26% change. As we really didn't need nine samples per plot, you could have gotten by with eight. Okay. Now at the whole landscape level here. Um, my ability to detect uh, change or detect difference between landscapes was lower. So I only had a, the ability to detect about a 50% change. And to detect sort of the desired uh, change, I actually would need to bump up the number of plots that I sampled to, to 18 rather than 5. Okay. Meseret is just it's a tool to help you figure out how many samples you need before you go out in the field. Make sure that once you do come back, did you power to detect the difference that you uh, that you went to? And if not, what kind of difference could you actually detect given the data that you had? Um, so I go in and, and, and you know, check out uh, Merit, um, you know, kick the top on it. Put real data in it, and try it out. Uh, let us know if if you run into to difficulty or issues with it. Um, and any questions on on Mesret? Okay.
Okay. Uh, go on to the next one then, and actually look, look at uh, uh, sample site selection. Um, using Excel, um, I think in the interest of time, I'm not actually going to switch over to Excel to do this. Um, but you know, in Excel can be used to to generate random selections. If you have a list of of um, entities or sample units, and you need to select a, uh, a number of them, you can use the rand function in Excel and then sort by those random numbers and take, say, like the top 10. It gives you a random selection of, uh, you know, of items. Okay. Contrast random selection to random point generation, and that's actually creating random locations for an area. So we have a, I guess we have a frame, technically, um, we don't have sample units themselves defined uh, for that frame. And there are a number of tools that we can use to do random point generation in ArcGIS. And the first one I want to show is it's a built-in one. It's called random points. And I'll go over to ArcGIS here. And so this is uh, this is a study area in southern Idaho. Again, um, we'll create some random uh, locations within there. And so random points is under the data management tools and the fast toolbox and create random points. Give it a put location and we'll do our demo directory. Whoops. And um we'll call simple random. Our training feature class, we're going to uh, just use the boundary. You specify a uh, uh, consisting feature class that has multiple polygons in it, then you can do stratified random sampling with this tool. Um, we'll 20 samples here. And then minimum of distance. This, this enforces a, a separation distance between your locations. Um, and a caution here, it's really tempting to use this to to enforce a good distribution of sample locations um, throughout your uh, your study area or your sample frame. But it's a really bad idea. This is it's it's not a tool for inch good spatial distribution. Um, because then if you're doing is saying, well, it's in like five kilometers for my minimum separation distance, I'm basically saying that each of my sample units is five kilometers in diameter, which there's, you know, we don't have the ability to, to sample in cases at that level. So what you should be putting in for the minimum allowed distance or these separation distances is the size of the sample unit or the size of your plot in the field. So you know, typically line point intercept, uh, when, when we do it, we use 50 meter transects. We offset them a little bit from the from the center, and we'll give ourselves a little bit of slack. And so we'll say 120 meters is as close as I want the center of two plots to be. Okay, and I can let this guy go, and it's pretty quick. It gives me a random set of locations within the, within the study area. So this is useful if you just need a, a quick set of random locations or stratified random locations. Um, it's built into ArcGIS. You don't need any additional software uh, for it, but a really simple uh, a tool, not a lot of sort of advanced functionality there. The next guy here is Hoth Tools, and this is like the work of soil generation. I think most people have, have used Hoth Tools or heard about it at, at some point in time, and you can do a lot of things with it. You can do um, you know, selections or stratified sampling. Uh, for point generation, you can do simple and stratified random. You can do unequal probability sampling, but there's there's some important limitations to that, that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so it gives you a lot of uh, flexibility. Um, it is a, it's an ArcGIS extension. It is free, but it does installer. I think most uh, of the agencies it's you know are, are approved to use this, but you'll have to have probably one of the IT people install it for you. 
So uh, we'll do some stratified random sampling with Hoth's tools. Uh, so uh, sampling tools on the Hoth's toolbar, and we'll do generate random points. I'm going to select now uh, this uh, D layer here, which actually has some additional polygons in it. Um, and again, I'm going to say 120 meter separation distance. Um, and we'll do uh, five points per stratum. And the field identifies my strata. And now an output name. Let that go. It should be pretty quick as well. Let's turn that off. Let's turn our strat on. Okay, now see we've five locations per uh, per stratum. Okay, easy way to do stratified random sampling um, using Hoth tools. Um, what I want to show is is one that we actually just released. Um, these are our set of sampling tools that we've developed here at the Hornada. And the purpose of developing these was to get a, a robust set of tools for doing unequal probability sampling. Um, I said before that host tools will do unequal probability sampling. But like I talked about earlier, in order to use unequal probability sampling, we have to know what the, the selection probabilities were for each of locations, okay? Um, because we need to use those to in the estimator to unbias our sample. Um, tools won't give you the selection probabilities, and so wrote these Hornada sampling tools to uh, to do that. Um, there are also, another or there are also other you know simple random sampling and stratified sampling tools within the Hornada set, but. I really want to just focus on these unequal probability sampling tools. We wrote this as an ArcGIS toolbox, so there's nothing to install. You just download the toolbox, add it, just like almost like you're adding a layer in your map, and you've got the tools available to you. We're working on putting these uh, on the web as actually a web service, a processing service, too, uh, that would make it even easier to, uh, to use. So let's flip back over here. Um, I'll turn that layer back on. And so I have this, uh, um, this layer in the background that I developed as a as a probability surface. It doesn't really mean anything in terms of this landscape. I just want some areas that had a, a low probability, which is actually the white. I should have switched it around. A low probability sampling, and some areas that have a higher probability sampling, which are these black areas here. Uh, so we'll open the Hata sampling tools toolbox and green equals selection probability tool and we want to samples in on our EO layer uh, we'll separation distance at 200 meters for now uh, our probability surface is this test layer uh, we're at 20 samples and uh, one of the things that we wrote into this too is a f ability in how you say how many sample points that you want so um, a lot of times we say, okay, well, you know, I want, uh, um, you know, like one point per thousand acres. Um, so I could I could write it in uh, like that, uh, 0 0.001 points per acre, um, and we'll let this go. It's taken to run um, to calculate the uh, the uh, selection probabilities, and it is an output. Uh, you can see, looking at it, that you know, most of our samples are concentrated in the darker areas, uh, away from the lighter areas. We do occasionally get one that's in the lighter area, but I mean, this is random sampling, so you would expect that. Uh, if we open up the attribute table for this, though, you'll see that, that we have the sort of ID numbers and the coordinates, but then we also have a column with the selection probabilities. And we can use those in an estimator. Um, to to calculate our unbiased estimates for for this area, and I didn't this before, but uh, we there is an estimator that goes with this. Um, it's a, an Excel spreadsheet right now. It's on the the Hornada website uh, that you can download to to use sample data 
that you would that you would have from this. And again, that link is in the references document. Okay, we're on, on here. A tool we want to look at is uh, um, uh, NOAA, the biogeography branch of NOAA put out this um, ARC tool called the sampling design tool. And it's, uh, you know, some of the, the sort of usual aspects, simple random, stratified random sampling, it's different. It actually has an analysis tool built into it as well, so you, you can analyze those data. Um, the thing I want to show about this, which is kind of neat, is that it does two-stage sampling. And two-stage sampling has randomization at, at two levels. Um, so you define some sort of large um, block in your your sampling uh, frame and, uh, called sampling units, and you randomly select some of those. And then when those randomly selected sampling units, then you select uh, random locations to uh, sample within each of these primary sampling units. And so uh, often used when you have all these strata, but it's not possible uh, to get a sample all of the strata that you have. And so you you select some of them, and then you randomly generate locations within those ones that you selected. Um, this tool pretty it's pretty cool. Um, it works well. It's a it's a, an ArcGIS toolbar, so it's just a button you put on the toolbar, not a, not a full extension. It does require an, an installer, so you know you have to uh, um, jump through some hoops to get this uh, installed on a, on a on a government computer. Let's do this one real. Real quick, um, turn some of these things off. So our, our strata. Here's the for the sampling design tool from NOAA. And two stage sampling using our strata layer. And we'll run it. And I'll do five random points per primary sampling unit. And it's telling here, okay, well, you have 20 primary sampling units in your uh, in, in your polygon file here. So I'm going to select five of those 20, and we'll let that go, and uh, we'll call it stage. And use that. Okay, so you can see it's highlighted then the randomly selected uh, these primary sampling units and then it's generated for us five random locations within each of these primary sampling units. So it's a really easy to use two-stage sampling tool. Okay. The last one that I want to go over is... Jason? Yes. Hi, this is Mike McManus. Yeah, Mike. Uh, could you just open up the uh, file of that? I just want to see if that I'd also include the selection probabilities for each stage. I, I don't know if it did not actually. Doesn't look like it did. Okay, so you do the coordinates. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Last one here is this concept of spatially balanced sampling. We talked here about sort of the of using minimum separation distances to to make sure you have good distribution of samples. You're really interested, or the good distribution of samples is really important to you from a sampling standpoint. Then you should be looking at a spatially balanced sampling technique. And spatially balanced sampling, your samples are even spaced across the frame, um, and the sequence of them is arranged such that if you go in order, you sample the first point, the second point will be right next. To the first point, the second point will be sort of a good distance away. Um, an advantage to this, and I'll, I'll illustrate this in a second, is that it gives you a good technique for drawing backup samples in case you have to throw a sample out, um, so that you automatically know what's the next sample, and you know choosing that sample maintains the sort of statistic, statistical properties of the of the sample that you have. Uh, there are a number of different spatially balanced sampling techniques. Um, the one that's used a lot in ArcGIS is called the reverse randomized quadrat recursive roster method. Um, it's abbreviated by RRQRR, and they call it ROCKER for short. Um, 
and a uh, it's an ArcGIS toolbox like the Hornada tools. Um, it's it's easy to get and install. Um, it's a really powerful technique, and there's a lot of neat things that you can do with it. It is a fairly involved technique to actually uh, um, actually do. But I'm just going to actually show you some of the outputs uh, from, from it. So let's turn that off. Okay, I actually did this for a for a different area. Let's load some of these rocker files in. And okay. so Rocker comes in as an ArcGIS toolbox. Um, they use a little tilde, so it'll always be at the top here. And three steps to actually do Rocker, three different tools that you have to run. And the first is this random sequence grid. And color, I mean, this looks like static, you know, from a from an old TV set, right? Um, but the the values here actually mean something, and so this is a value of 1,007. Now, 1,008 will be somewhere else on the uh, on the image, sort of spaced out from it, and so the the colors here represent the actual values, and so this sort of sets the order, the spatial distribution uh, of these, of your ultimate sample points with this, uh, it's called the sequence roster. Okay, and next step that you do is actually go in and what they call filter the sequence roster. And so you, in, in essence, sort of clip it to your C area. Um, and you can actually modify the, uh, um, uh, the sequence a little bit with some of the tools in there. Uh, you can include different selection probabilities uh, within this uh, this filtered sequence structure as well. And the last thing that you do is use this filtered sequence roster uh, to generate a number of random uh, sample locations. Right? Now they look on a, on a regular grid because they are. And I developed I did this with sort of a, a purposely very coarse so just we could see how it was working in there. Um, and so the, a set of random locations um, developed from Rocker. If we open the attribute table and look here, we can see a lot of interesting things. One is that there's order associated with these points. So the first point that we would sample would be number three up here sort of on the north end. Okay. Then we sample number seven, which is a fair ways south of that one. Okay, then number 15, number 15, 20, okay. Then what if we got to number 23, and we could get to number 23? Well, if you throw number 23 out and just write to point number 26, okay, it means that spatial balance of, of, the, uh, of the sample. And so generated here 100 sample locations, right? right? Maybe I'm only going to sample 10 of them. So I take the first 10 of them in order, and that defines a nicely balanced set of samples for the study area. Okay. But I take any SQL set of 10 have the same spatial balance as any other set will. Okay. As you uh, get to a spot that you that you can't sample or that you have to throw out for some reason, reason, then spatially balanced sampling is really cool because you just take the next one in line. There's never any question of what's the next uh, location that we that we would pick. Okay, on, on spatially balanced sampling. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's finish this off here. And uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, this table together just to sort of a comparison of the different sort of sample design tools that we've looked at today in terms of what they can and they can't do. I will make this uh, presentation available so you can spend more time going over uh, it. A number of these tools um, uh, with stratification. So Rocker doesn't actually do stratification, 
but you know, you take your area up into the different polygons and then run them individually and accomplish stratification sort of the hard way using Rocker. That's what the asterisk mean. Um, for hot tools with unequal probability sampling, I put sort of. The reason I put sort of is, well, it technically does it, but it doesn't give you the selection probabilities, so it's not of a whole lot of use uh, there. So, And with that, I guess I'd like to just I'll put up, um, these are the links to the references and some additional information. And um, I encourage you please to go to the link below and, and fill out the evaluation. And with that, I will, I'll entertain any questions or comments that people have. Jason, this is Tess. I have a question yeah. that is probably too basic, and I should have figured that a while ago. But now go for it. You're talking about, you know, kind of some of the first stage of this with mapping the ecological sites. Mm -hmm. I know that the soil mapping units have been mapped, but it's not necessarily a one-to-one, -one, is it, for the ecological sites? Like, how would? So, what is the exact process there for getting ecological? sites mapped in your GIS? Um, so, well, if, you know, it sometimes devolves to uh, you know, vegetation mapping uh, exercise. Um, so, you know, the, that area in Laidlaw Park and uh, Craters of the Moon uh, is a really good example because we have some uh, soil map units that are, are say, uh, you know, the tip stage, and uh, there will also be uh, basin dig stage in the same soil map unit. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the basic sage is going to occur on those sort of deeper soils, a little moisture, you know, the swales. There. And so to to do that, uh, you, would, you would have to go in and actually map those areas out or make the decision that, that, that those areas are going to respond similarly enough to management or disturbance that we could treat them as as the same thing. So what we're seeing right now is actually sort of both things happening. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of effort, especially in the southwest here, being placed on mapping the actual ecological sites. Um, there's also a lot of effort right now being put into um, to combine ecological sites into larger groupings that respond in similar with the management or disturbance. So, yeah, it, it, in absence of that, and, and you do get into some situations um, in the U.S. and then, I mean, it's every place else in the world, right, where we don't have ecological sites defined. Right. In those cases, uh, what we're tending to use are sort of, um, you know, landform uh, combinations, so, you know, hill slope, valley bottom, designations or combinations of, of uh, you know, landform and, and, and ecology, um, just to try to get some sort of stable unit, ecological units that are related to, to sort of communities on the ground. Okay. Any other questions? Can I ask folks just to offer up what kind of, uh, you know, sampling, sample design tools that you've been using? I mean, I know a couple of them here are new, but some of them are the old standbys. Um, does anybody say what, what they've used in the past? This is John Lee. I'm trying to remember, but I want to say there was a set of tools from, was it Patent Wildlife uh, somewhere? Was a GIS tool that I had used at one point. Okay. Anything different? Okay. That I'm familiar with that I didn't include today, um, and it's a, actually a standalone tool that was developed at the Pacific National Lab. Uh, called VSP, Visual Sample Plan, 
um, it's intended for sort of uh, um, monitoring for, say, like um, you know, waste spills or or um, you know, pollution or unexpected ordinance, that kind of thing. But it also can be used in a in a rangeland context. And there's a to that in these uh, in these references here. Any other thoughts? Any other questions before we sign off? Okay. I hope you uh, you all found this useful. Um, I appreciate your time. And uh, again, um, please take some time to out the evaluation. Let us know how we're doing and uh, how we can improve. So thank you much. Bye-bye.